Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Contrary to popular wishes, we have not all been super glued to our seats and subjected to Vilgon poetry. This is episode 6 of the Tux Radar podcast. I'm Paul Hudson. I'm Mike Sanders. I'm Graham Morrison. And I'm Andrew Gregory. And in this podcast, we're going to be talking about GTK 3 finally coming forward, Windows shipping apparently on 96% of all netbooks, Spotify's new API for Linux, and should netbook makers use a single distro? Don't forget, we're releasing a new podcast every two weeks, available for free from TuxRail.com, where we also publish fantastic news, features, and more, so bookmark it today. And actually, this this podcast, right now, there's a new issue of Linux Format Magazine on sale. It's great. It's particularly good. You can find out how to get the best distro for you. Uh, You can read about Subversion, Grease Monkey, Clonezilla, the Acer Aspire One, Moblin, and much more. Because if you like TuxRail, you'll love Linux Format. And yes, before you say otherwise, it is indeed on sale worldwide. If you want to subscribe, go to tinyurl.com slash podcast LXF. So the top news this week is, of course, GTK 3.0. There are now the first draft plans, I think, out to the mailing list. Yeah, it's like a preliminary roadmap at this stage. They're uh, a request for comments. It's basically the stage it's in. And uh, First impressions? Well, they've outlined various features that they want to put in, like resolution independence, which would be great. Um, but what strikes me from the plan is that there are a lot of cool features in there that they're waiting for other developers to implement, or they hope that other developers will implement. Things like animations and physics. It's, it seems more of a wishful thinking list rather than an all-out plan. Did you see their first plans, though? Because they, they talked about it at Guidec last year, last July or something it was, and uh, the first plan was remove all the uh, public fields, add no new features and just release it like that and then add features in subsequent releases. Really? Uh, basically so that 3.0 would be like uh, KDE 4.0, a sort of binary compatibility layer. And after that, they just add things. So uh, obviously a lot of folks, including people like Miguel de Cars, were very upset about that because it's a silly idea. Well, <laughs> so, I, I guess you can get away with that more um, as a toolkit because it, it's not something that end users really worry about. When KDE went to 4.0 with loads of features missing, mm. everybody was up in arms, but... I guess they'd say, well, don't use GTK for any proper apps until GTK 3.2 or something when we've plugged in the guards. Yeah, but this is what a lot of guys said about 4.0 of KDE. I understand what you're saying about it's a finished product, but a major version release in people's brains that says this is a finished product, start using it, great new features. You can't just say, hey, there's nothing new, wait for 3.2, 3.4. Just just call it 2.9.9 if you want to do some beta testing, fair enough. Add features. That's true, that's, that's the normal way to go about it, isn't it? Yeah, I had kind of presumed that GTK would always stay in the 2 revision and, and never kind of make Forever. it. Forever, yeah. I mean, like Emacs. They seem like to be doing I mean, one of, one of the things was um, a palette widget, for which would be which they meant to get into the 2 revision, which they've now pushed back to 3, so why not just stick it in now? You know, they could do the same with Cairo and resolution independence if they want to do, because the applications are going to have to be ported to take advantage of it. It's true, but the, the wish list I thought was where the best things were. They want to, for example, do some really cool non-breaking changes that wouldn't break API, that wouldn't break programs built on GDK. One of them is to basically bin the entire theming system and replace it with something like QT's uh, CSS system, which is very cool and everyone seems to be liking, and, and it looks really good and it's much easier and all these great things. But that wouldn't change the API, would it? Because that's all it wouldn't, something yeah, it just, you store just in config files. But of course, as like you said, you've got the things they're going to do themselves, then the sort of hopefully some somewhere else contribution community list. And this is in the wish list, the sort of third layer down. So uh, I'm not sure how likely it is to actually happen. But yeah, they've got some great ideas. They want to add multi-touch, for example. Yeah, that, that was almost a footnote as well, wasn't it, in the yeah, list of yeah. features, which is something perhaps we should be putting higher up on the priority list. Yeah, we don't you want know. to all get sued by Apple, do we? No, but no. it's a bit scary because multi-touch is something that's so core to uh, these two toolkits nowadays it needs, needs to be cool. Yeah. If they didn't do it in 3.0, you're talking 4.0, aren't you? And that's a long, long that's way 27 away. years away. Do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> that's a conservative yeah. estimate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so they, I think they need to get that in 3.0 as a matter of priority. Same, same as an animation. If they don't do it now, it will not happen for a long time. Or if it, is, if it will happen, it won't be backported. You know, no one will be using it because you can't be guaranteed it's there. Also, I think there's a, there's a throbber too. Um, that's one of the things they want uh, other people to implement. That's yeah. one of the things they're hoping that the community will fill in, a spinning, <laughs> loading thing. That's what a throbber is. You, you know. Yeah, if, like you know, the, the old Netscape navigator, little comets thing, or the N, N sign, or the... And, and this is a big, significant feature. Yeah. That this it is, is, yeah, it is. Something to get well, excited about. It is. Well, I know it sounds strange, but if you think about um, how common they are in things like Ajax websites, 
when you do something, it's thinking about it, it shows a little spinny thing. Mm. There isn't something like that right now. You, just, you get, you know, uh, a little spinning white cursor, don't you? Which it's, is lame. it's not not really something any of us with a modicum of programming knowledge could implement. Why is that on a... And there, need- Mike Saunders <laughs> signs up to the community contribution <laughs> to the Earth Robber. Good, good, work, do, I'll, I'll be, good I'll, work, Mike. I'll become... Leave, leave now. <laughs> this <isn't> too long. <laughs> and moving on, Microsoft has claimed that Windows ships on 96% of all netbooks. Uh, we actually put up a, a new story about that, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Well, we should... Clarify that Microsoft is giving these statistics for US markets and Linux up- uptake is obviously bigger in other countries as well, especially Germany and developing countries. So, but even then, you know, 96% it seems remarkably high. Do you see when you see people using Netflix, Graham, do you see people 96% of them running Windows? <laughs> um, no, I, mean, I think I, I wrote something similar in, in the uh, last issue of the magazine, but um, no, I mean, it, it's a very optimistic figure, but it's one that. Microsoft. It's one of Microsoft's tactics, isn't it? It's 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 the kind of um, shock and awe <laughs> effect of you know we monopolise everything. We're brilliant. We're doing everything we can, and uh, and it makes people talk about Microsoft and do exactly what we're doing now. I'm, I'm sure it's not ninety six percent. But given that the the trouble they've had in the past for being a monopoly, you think it would do them better to say we've got ninety percent of netbooks, but by saying look we completely slaughter and dominate another market and not allow anybody else to get into it, then they might end up in front of the European Commission again. Or, was it mentioned on a blog? Was that what it was? It was, it, like it was a on, development. It was blog. on the Microsoft Windows team experience <laughs> or some combination. That's, of that's those interesting. Words. Thing. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't just some uh, high up. PR yeah, yeah. release. It was just some guy saying, hey, this is what we've heard from our uh, hardware manufacturers. But, but it, it had been peppered with all this, the usual PR stuff. So he, he yeah. gave the stats and then he was saying, why do people choose Windows then? It's because it's, you don't have to use yeah, the command yeah. line and, and other remarks that are perhaps not applicable so much to Linux today. Well, well, I think we've talked about this in the past, haven't we? How a lot of people will be dissuaded from buying Linux on netbooks because at, at the point of sale they can the, the, the company selling it can make more money from Windows netbooks or, well, yeah, or you, have fewer returns whatever they're you, saying you sell somebody a Windows netbook and you can sell them not an anti-internet exactly, you know, exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah Microsoft's almost giving it away you don't have to worry about codecs you don't have to worry about anything like that it's a familiar operating system you know I mean they've done a good job at clawing back you know their, their traditional market share after initial Linux inroads into it so. well yeah that, with, with the amount of money they've got if they're operating like a traditional company, I think they'd have to fight this battle harder, but they can just give XP away yeah, for the yeah. next 200 years if need be. What sort of um, Vista user experience do you think you get on an Aspire 1? Even hardcore Windows fans really hate Vista on netbooks. I mean, a lot of them hate Vista anyway, so there's a lot of anticipation that Windows 7 will fix all these problems and be really super fast and light on netbooks. And Of course, netbook specs will go up as well when a 2 gigahertz Atom comes out. It's out. So it's out now, is it? Mm. Wow. It, it, I find it very curious, though, because um, Keir Thomas, the uh, author and pundit, said it's legally questionable to supply proprietary components pre-installed on Linux netbooks, because I think that's what's really missing. And this is something that Chris Kenyon from Canonical said. They said, actually, they recommend people to pre-install Flash and Media Codex and actually recommend to purchasers, to uh, OEMs, to purchase from Microsoft the Windows Media Codex as Ubuntu recommending to pay Microsoft money, right. which is very curious, I think, just to get a better netbook experience. Uh, so people obviously do want the basics to work out of the box. And I guess the companies who are shipping Linux stuff don't want to pay the extra $2 approximately it costs. It probably starts costing them more than it would to just stick XP on there. Yeah, if you get an XP for, for five bucks, then yeah, well, you're buying these codecs from Fluendo and Microsoft. Moving on. Uh, Mono 2.4 has been released along with Mono Develop 2.0. Do any of you care? It, Mono 2.4 is faster. Is it? It what? is. How? Yeah. Go. Um, because some light like, JIT engine has been replaced with another JIT engine. I'm not sure that's true. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I read anyway. They re- they've removed an old JIT engine yeah. that wasn't being used anyway. But what if you were using that one by accident? What if so- <laughs> Dash dash use old, old JIT, JIT engine. Yeah. Yeah. I always put that thing in. Yeah. I always put that command in. It is, it is slightly less memory intensive for some particular small tasks. Right. Uh, very particularly, and this is because I'm a mono freak. <laughs> Uh, XPath using XML is 15% less memory intensive. Awesome. Wow. So all those XPath and that, programs that, that you're is, writing. That is pretty much the headline feature. <laughs> there was something about polling as well. Wasn't there, there is, yeah. Some cross-platform thread interruption. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. blah. It, was, it was really, really dull release. 
but it makes sense because of uh, uh, Sousa Linux Enterprise 11, which ships as standard. In, or as a mono, sorry, as a mono extension. Mono. So you pay extra, for, pay extra for mono, apparently, nowadays. Well, you, you buy Sousa Linux Enterprise, and, and then you, you buy, buy the mono, you buy the mono. Well, no, because they're saying with this release, with this 2.4 release, there's, there are so few new features because it's basically rock solid, that's the idea. Okay. So in this release, you, you pay for mono, and they will support you in getting your Windows programs to work on Linux. That's, right. the, that's the, the promise right. they make. It's actually quite a cool promise. But more importantly, Mono Develop 2.0 has come out, mm-hmm. and that is cool. That is, that is actually, What's that got? It's, got? it's got bloody exciting stuff, wow. well, if you actually care. Firstly, it's got debugging. You can actually set breakpoints, which, oh, yeah. which is like, oh my god, I've had that in years. Every other OS language in the whole world. How did you, how did you write programs before that? You used to do <laughs> console.write line. I, I is this. <laughs> uh, it was really terrible. Um, it supports C Sharp 3 for co completion, which is uh, random but helpful. Um, curiously, it's, it switches to the Visual Studio project format from Microsoft. MS Build? It is indeed well, MS Build. I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah, MS Build. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's impressive. Mike, well done. Um, yeah, so you actually take your whole MS project and load it on, on um, Windows. It, it basically saves that natively now, so you can move it around freely, which I think is a very, very interesting move. They had their own project format for quite a while, I guess, so they could not look too MS aligned, and now they sort of actually sod it. <laughs> they just have their stuff too. Yeah, whatever works for them. It's got cold folding, it's got change markers, you can now target particular .NET versions. It's got loads of stuff. It's actually a very, very exciting release. Now we just need to convince the uh, Linux community that C Sharp is actually pretty good. <sighs> yeah, I love C Sharp. Mm. There you go. I, I come out absolutely clear. I think C Sharp is the finest coding language known to man. Address all hate mail and bombs <laughs> to Graham.Morrison. <laughs> 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 No, it's true. I mean, I, I, I really, I, I, I've got to admit, I'm not happy that it's Microsoft technology. I, w- I wish it weren't. I wish it was everyone's happy to use it. But it, it was Microsoft originated. I know, I know, I know. But, but now it, it's something. Problem is, if I, if I write something in C sharp, write a program, I get haters saying, hey, "You shouldn't use that. You should use Python." No, Python's pants. Python is terrible in comparison. <laughs> Python is not as good as C sharp. Well, I like Python too, but I, I, I've done a bit of C sharp programming, and I do like the language, and that's what should matter at the end of the day. We shouldn't be running around screaming and, and right. bawling and having tantra. But when the riders of the apocalypse come and Microsoft exercises its patents on C Sharp and .NET... C Sharp's an ISO standardised language. Well, OK, what, what about the .NET framework? That large, Will all your large programs chunks of that are, then uh, become immediately redundant? Large chunks of that are ISO standardised as well. Not all of it is. Some l- Large chunks of it is, though. The bits I use all are. Right. And what I care about is I say, OK, load me SDL, fiddle with, fiddle with SDL, yeah, yeah. fiddle with OpenGL. Yeah. I'm using the language to interface with all the native stuff. That's what I care about, native technology. Is there any mechanism in place to ensure that you do keep to open technology within... Maybe there should be. No, mono. no, I'm, I'm not aware of one, no. Uh, maybe there should be, yeah. So I'd, I'd much rather use mono. I, I, what did I do? I was, I, was, I was testing this game recently, G-Brainy. Yeah, I think I've heard a, that. a brain training game, right? Brain training game, very simple. It's built on mono. I hadn't realised. It looked, it looked just like every other GTK app out there. Looked and worked. It was built on Cairo with uh, GTK. Right. It looked and worked flaws, loaded quickly, and yet it was, it was mono. You can't do that in Java, as far as I'm aware. You do it in Python, though. Yeah. You, can, you can do it in Python, yeah. But Python is a hideous <laughs> programming <laughs> language. I get sick of typing bloody, bloody, underscore, underscore, in it, underscore, underscore, colon, so, all so this yeah. crap. And why is there no switch case? Why is there no switch case? Damn you, Guido Van Rossum. <laughs> I think we're going to need to get Guido in here, aren't we, somehow? <laughs> all right, we need, to, we need to bring this one back in. Mono 2.4 has been released. Great. And, and with that, the news ends. <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, this week's Hot Topic follows the release of a Spotify library, a binary library for Linux, um, potentially enabling uh, Linux users to listen to their Spotify music if they have a premium subscription to the service. Spotify is um, at the moment a Windows and OS X application that looks very much like iTunes, except for you can listen to the music immediately. Um, You don't have to buy anything um, it's financed presumably by the adverts that are interspersed into the music every 20 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes or so, as well as banner ads that uh, scroll in and out of the main application window. It's quite addictive because you end up uh, listening to music you wouldn't normally pay for or want to uh, go out of your way to listen to. But um, Yeah, so the idea is that you've got a huge music library. It's, yeah. it's gigantic. You've, I've found really random old artists on there, full albums to listen to, just double click, it'll start playing the entire thing. You can go through everything you want free of charge. And, and, and those who've never used it before will probably be asking, how do they make any money off this? 
Yeah, well, nobody really knows if they are making any money off it. Secret. It was it was Andrew's discovery of the week um, a couple of episodes ago. Yes. You're ahead of the curve. And now it's exploded in For popularity. A change. <laughs> and uh, yeah, th- at that time it, it was because you managed to get it to work on wine. So does this mean that you won't have to use wine anymore? Um, it means that people who pay for a premium account in the UK, it's £9.99 a month. You don't get the adverts. Is that about, what, $12 right now? $13? Yeah, probably about... About $14 right $7. Now. Five, five dollars. dollars <laughs> <laughs> $50. 50 Yeah, so if you have a premium account um, and you've got the programming skill, you can create a, an application natively on your Linux desktop and listen to Spotify music. Yes. But it's closed source. It's closed source. So you can't, you can't share it with, with anyone? Um, you can create applications. You can share them with people, yes, because oh, cool. the, you, you just link to the library. If you're interested in doing it, you have to apply for an application key which you embed within your application, and then, and then you're free to share it. And presumably Spotify keep a log of how their music is being accessed. But the, the key point here that is that you have to have a premium account. And I don't know, but presumably, by, by and large, most people don't have a premium account. And with this library, it gives you the potential of skipping the adverts. Or well, also, the, the library only works with premium users. Yeah, exactly. So, And I'm, I'm saying it's always going to be the case. I don't see it ever coming to a... It's never going to mature into a Spotify application, a general Spotify application for the Linux desktop, because you, you'll be able to skip adverts. How? Well, you could, you could silence the volume when you detect the advert. You could, you could do all kinds of things. You could work out the track length. Um, if the track length is exceeded, you could silence that. You could buffer it, drop it out of the buffer. There's all kinds of things you could do. You could certainly try and hack it, but the way I see it is that, that if, if right now on the OS X version, if you try and reduce the volume, it detects that. Yeah, but if, if you're responsible for you, you grab the, the audio data through the library and then you, you, you stick that in your own buffer, you know, you can detect whether you've got an advert in there, chop it out. Yeah, you could try. Yeah. So, I, and I'm guessing that's why it's for you, premium users only. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense for a start, doesn't it? So they can track it more easily who's using it and why they're using it. And they don't have to worry about people cutting the adverts out because they've already paid for that premium account. So it's a step in the right direction. I mean... I don't think people cut adverts out because, I, because you know, on a general Linux desktop, if that happened, Spotify would just turn it off. They haven't got the resources to fund free music for the world. Well, they, they would just disable the free account and then they would have sunk it for everyone very publicly. Yeah, but they've obviously not got the resources to write a Linux application, which they see, it seems like they see the demand for as well. And, and this is kind of throwing something out to the community, hoping that they'll pick it up and stick it into Amarok or Rhythmbox. Yeah, I'm guessing actually this is something they've had all along. They must have had this to begin with. Yeah, to build their own stuff. With. It can't be that difficult to do. I mean, no. if you look at if you look at the API, it's it's pretty straightforward. You know, you can get artist information, you can get associated artists, cover cover data, and the audio stream. Also, um, there's, there's lots of example source code. Do you have a look at yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. The, the example source code looks really straightforward. Yeah, it, it is really easy to use. You could use that today if you had a premium account, compile that, listen to music on the command line. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, one of the examples is, I think, a command line jukebox of playing your playlists. Yeah, which yeah. Which is just basic and exactly what people want to do most of the time, really. And, and it really would be amazing if it let people without a premium account to use Spotify in this way. I mean, it opens up so much potential. Yeah. Um, and it's a pity that I can't see a way around that happening or being able to happen. Yeah, I guess they could just not provide the uh, track length for adverts. Yeah. Or something like that, or for all of them. Yeah. Like, just, whatever it takes to make it work, I'm happy. Yes, I think I am as well, yeah. You know, given that most people out there, I presume, are not users of the premium account, they're just a free one with adverts, and they seem quite happy to listen to the adverts, because the yeah. adverts aren't that, that intrusive and they're pretty rare, quite frankly. Uh, I don't think it's a problem. I think people are happy to yeah, I do whatever agree. it takes to get free music. Yeah. Well, also, you... Roberta from Spotify has got a really nice voice. <laughs> She just one of the once an hour or so, yeah, one of the adverts. And uh... I, I am one of only two people in Britain to never use Spotify, and the other one is me as well, due to an administrative error. But that's you don't have an internet connection, do you? No. So uh, a person from the other side of the street flashes data to you with a, a spotlight, and you, and you write down the bits and type it into Mac OS, a Mic OS. <laughs> 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 that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> so it'd be nice if it, if it led. To, I mean, it would actually be really easy to write um, a cute application using the Spotify library um, and make it exactly as functional as the uh, OS X and Windows uh, applications. This, this is great. So is this is this you offering to build one as well now? Well, after, after Mike's uh, coding challenge, right? The, under the throbber, and then I haven't got a premium account. And I'm not quite pushed to do it. I mean, how about as part of a, of a larger cutie designer tutorial series? <laughs> <laughs> how, yeah, possibly. 
Possibly, yeah. How about we get um, a, a premium account bought for you on expenses? Yes. And then okay, you I'll can do use it. that yeah. as the basis yeah. of a tutorial series. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> you heard it here first? <laughs> I'll, write, I'll write that one down. <laughs> Still to come, of course, is our Discovery of the Week, where we outline one great thing we've found in the last two weeks or so. Uh, why is it called Discovery of the Week if it's the last two weeks or so? Um, because you only get one week to discover it. And we're not allowed to say Fortnite. That's yeah. true. It was originally this uh, outtake, I guess, for the uh, readers who listen to this, listeners who listen to this. Subscribers only get the outtakes. <laughs> we, we were going to call this Discovery of the Fortnite, because Fortnite means two weeks in, in real English. We don't think Americans know what Fortnite means. So if you, if you know what Fortnite means, leave a comment on this blog and tell us and we'll change to a discovery of the Fortnite. Yes. Stupid Americans. Then All right. <laughs> <laughs> and also, also, though we love Americans, we do. We're not afraid of them. Um, <laughs> Hi, Chad. Hi, Chad. All right, moving on. Hi, and, Cuba. Uh, and still to, still to come, of course, is the open ballot as well. Well, we're asking, should netbook makers standardise on a single Linux distro? Right. Gather round, children, for discovery of the week. Graham, Fortnite. why yeah, don't I, you start? Well, I've spent ages looking for a music-related discovery of the oh, week because good it's work. been a good few weeks since I had one. And, yeah, that's true. And it is a, a utility that I found eight years ago. Eight years ago? Uh, no, no. A year ago. A few years ago. A discovery of a few years, all right. It's, uh, it's called Soft Squeeze, and um, it's actually a, a Java application, but we can, <laughs> uh, we can forgive it for that. But what it does is it connects to your... Slim Server. Slim Server, um, it's a server running on your music media player that catalogues all your music and provides a web interface and can also stream music to um, proprietary boxes now made by Logitech. Okay. But the, the Slim Server software is open source and you can listen to your music through a web browser as well. And it's, it's great. It grabs um, albums, playlists, you can l- subscribe to podcasts. This is all done through Slim Server and the web interface. Now, Soft Squeeze is a Java application that connects to your Slim Server either through an SSH tunnel or directly if you're on the LAN. Um, and sits just like a normal application on your desktop and works just like the hardware unit sold by Logitech and lets you listen and access your music. It's great. So you, you can add effects and stuff, you know, for complete Luddites like me. Um, no, it, you do. it doesn't, there's no effects to it. No, it just means that if, if you've got a large music collection sitting on a server somewhere, you can access it from uh, a laptop or while you're away from uh, your house or from anywhere on the internet through this application. Oh, right, like, so remote access. Yeah, it's an interface to your music collection, and it lets you listen to it. So, um, you know, the Slim Server catalogues everything, um, sorts it by genre or artist or album, and uh, this little application. How does it perform for a a desktop Java app? It's pretty good. I mean, there's there's not that much that it's doing, really. Um, It's just uh, sending instructions to the server and streaming the audio back. Streaming the music back, right. Um, But it works great, and if you happen to use Slim Server, which I can highly recommend, it's the best way of using it at the moment. Best way, yeah, and it saves saves you uh, forking out for one of Logitech's expensive boxes. Too right, we don't like spending money here in Discovery of the Week. <coughs> um, my discovery of uh, yesterday is Kana Test, which is a program for practicing learning Japanese characters. Another one? Would you believe it? Uh, yeah, well, the other one was a game, but this is just an all-out learning tool. So um, this is level two. Yes, yeah. This, this, this <laughs> moving on. Have we learned the characters yet? <laughs> No, no, no. Japanese is easy, man. You messing about that. Um, so, yeah, this lets you learn katakana and the hiragana scripts, the syllabaries. Um, Sorry? Katakana. <laughs> Back uh, on topic. <laughs> what makes this app so special is that you can set up your own lessons to use in individual characters, the ones that you forget quite a lot, and then create graphs and charts of how much you fail or succeed. So you can get a real good visual indication of what you need to learn, and I love it. So, so you can get a 3D pie chart saying fail. Basically, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Just a re- you fail in a really attractive way. <laughs> yeah, firm, yeah. yeah, what you're doing wrong. So that's mine. Andrew? Well, as, as you know, I, I moved house last week. I, I looked. I found some of my old psychology books from university and, and um, opened out, opened it at random on a page about IQ testing and how uh, it's um, the results are often skewed because different cultures have different kinds of logic that are all equally valid. And you know, if you're coming from one kind of thought process, you know it might not come through on a standard Western IQ test. So one of the examples given was um, they showed some some people. Um, a picture of a red tomato, a red car, a red shirt, and a green tree. 
and uh, asked them for the odd one out. And the answer in, in our culture would be would be the treat because it's green. But um, there's whatever tribe in Africa they were testing it on kept picking the tomato. And the, the intelligence testers couldn't work out why these people were so thick that they couldn't work out that it was obviously the green one that was the odd one out. And then uh, when they went back and asked them, the... Um, these bushmen said, well, it's, it's the only one you can eat. And, uh, uh, it's a different kind of priority to a, what was important. Yeah, a, yeah. An, an, equally, an equally sensible sort of logical structure, but one that was, that was alien to the, the chaps that they were testing. And I feel that way using Yast. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best lead-in to some Yast criticism ever. Because I, I, can see, I can see that it's all there. I... I I can see the logic. There is a logic, but it's just not my logic. Yeah, I did just remind listeners uh, that the uh, configuration toolkit from OpenSUSE and SUSE Learns Enterprise 11 carry on. But, but I, can, I can look at it. I can, I can take a step back, and I, I know that it does everything. It does everything that I want it to do. If you step too far back, you can't see anything. It's just a yeah, that's, massive noise. That's, that's, obviously, <laughs> that's obviously rubbish. I need to stand in some sort of middle ground <laughs> with a pair of binoculars. What I thought was interesting about what you just said is if, if that test, the, site, the original um, IQ test was so obvious. How did they come up with the test in the first place? You know, we'll test you know a whole population on this completely obvious thing where there's one green thing and four red things, and there's a chance some distant tribe somewhere might pick something else. So. Well, I don't know. I, I assume it's like the opening questions in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? It's got to ah oh, right. That's what you mean. Get, yeah, get past, yeah, gets yeah. the first thousand pounds. Or maybe it was yeah. just to determine if, if the uh, participant was colour blind at the start. There was, there was another excellent one. Um, racing is to Ascot what boating is to... And then there's a multiple choice. Yeah, and then yeah. one of the answers is Henley, which is the right answer. And this was included in some, some IQ tests from the 30s. <laughs> 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 and, and, and made, absolutely amazing. Brilliant. Well done, lads. I think I, think I did the same course as you, because I, I did the same thing. And, and I, I did a test and got the IQ of a, a seven-year-old. <laughs> because it was, it was an yes, IQ that's, test. that's why. Yeah. I think well, no, 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 because the one it was the one I did was apparently for married black people in North America, and it was questions like to get the best flavour, how long should chitlins be left in the oven? And I, I got lost. I don't, I don't remember what chitlins yeah. is. You know, what the heck is it? I've got no idea. So I completely failed. <laughs> uh, does that leave me then? Can it I, does I, indeed. My, finally, I, mine isn't quite so long-winded. <laughs> a short and sweet. Uh, it's not even a program. My discovery of the week is actually quite pathetic because uh, I'm going to say it, and, and lots of guys are going to listen, listen to this and say, I, "I've known that for years, you moron, Paul." Well, yes, I'm afraid. I'll just come out with it. What I've discovered is that when you type a command on Linux and you hit enter, and it goes, uh, "You can't do that. You're not rude." What you do is you, you just type sudo or sudo, I guess, if you say it that way, sudo space. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Because exclam, exclam means last command on bash. And if you put sudo before it, it'll execute it as root. Because what I normally do is I normally type su uh, space dash, I guess if you're on Fedora, enter, and then copy and paste the command or type it again from scratch and hit enter. Which is just lame, because sudo exclam, exclam actually works uh, better. So as, as a guesstimate, how much more productive will you be now that you've learned this? I would say at, at least uh, five micro scobles. <laughs> That's <laughs> odd. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, in this week's Open Ballot, we're asking the question, should netbook manufacturers standardise on one distro? Um, this is not just for the sake of cutting down people's choice of being a distro fascists. We don't want to do that. Um, but we thought it, it might be nice if people possibly got a, a united front, um, a, a standard that we could all get behind uh, and use as a basis for development. Uh, so that would be something along the lines of the Mobilin project, which is currently being sponsored by Intel, or Debian, which um, of course is used as a, as a base for Ubuntu, CrunchBank, um, several other kinds of Linux distributions. It doesn't necessarily stifle people, but uh, it gives them all a, a base that they can build on and conquer the world, which is obviously what we want. Um, Mike? Yes. A standard distro for netbooks. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Yeah, I think we've got one already. It's called Ubuntu Netbook Remix. I think... But what about the choice, Mike? Hang on, does that mean I'm ahead of the curve again? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> by installing win. it. Made of win. Look, until Canonical does anything bad or wrong, or it, why are we bothered about saying, look, they are putting a lot of effort into making a distribution perfect for netbooks, getting the right drives in there, getting the screen space 
used adequately, used brilliantly, then let's just back behind that. There's nothing to lose. Well, I, g- I guess the argument is that people, some people might not agree with the way Canonical are doing things and they don't really have that much say over it. You know, it's a private concern. It's, it's kind of against the open source ethos. Um, if ca- Canonical want to put their own uh, interface to launch pad in there, then they can, you know, yeah. um, which we might not necessarily like. I mean, they won't do that for a netbook, but... I'm not saying it it solves all problems, but if we want netbooks with Linux to take off and deal with that potential 96% Windows figure that we were talking about before, then we have to make some sacrifices, like Churchill's whole thing on democracy. It may it may not be perfect, but it's the best we've got to have a standard distro. So in the same way that uh, the last episode's question was, should we have a united front, you think that it's better that we have a united front for all the faults and failures of whatever distro we choose? Oh, definitely. <laughs> Without a doubt, yeah. I, I think deal with this for now. Deal with, if this figure from Microsoft has any uh, validity to it, then we have to do something. And we can't give people... Because people get a netbook and they go on the internet and say, I want to install this. How do I do that? And you've got it all. What are you running? Are you running this Limpus thing? Or are you running the XY or Z distro with these updates? No, if you can just say, you've got a netbook with Linux, click A, then B, then C. That would be huge. I don't think it's ever going to happen. I think each netbook manufacturer is going to want to make their own secret deals, leverage their own kind of software, their own logos, their own kind of... But then they'll cock it up because somebody will buy one of these netbooks and and then think, oh, it's got Linux, go to UbuntuForums.com, and then it just turns into this gigantic mess. The uh, it's never going to happen theme came a few times. Hugh says, if all manufacturers use the same distro and put their pooled resources into it, it would be great for the consumer. However, how would they then compete... Um, he says some of the things, but ends with, no, I can't see it happening, but yes, I would like it to happen. Um, also shared by Charlie Ullman from TuxRadar.com, um, it's going to be much more difficult to try to form a consensus between the most pointlessly factional of all human populations, i.e. the Linux geek population. <laughs> If a Linux distribution were agreed upon, it would have to be a really robust and non-crashable one. Probably Debian, definitely not Ubuntu, Mike. Ooh. In your place. Wrong. Back to the, back to the naughty step. Why, why is it wrong? Uh, the, the, because we put this question on Twitter, and one of the responses was... The question was, should we standardise on one distro? And one of the responses was, yes, as long as it's Ubuntu. And I think that's very, very dangerous, because I, 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 can, I can see why Ubuntu Netbook Remix is popular. But I think there are some th- some things it does definitely, definitely wrong. One of which is the Maximus window manager. It automi- automatically maximizes everything. Right. And the problem is, the way GTK is designed is it's designed to handle multiple screen resolutions, so things just stretch to fit the screen. Yeah. So you've got a small dialog box, Maximus maximizes it, so the, win- the windows are, uh, buttons are a thousand pixels across, which looks stupid. It's very, very hard to I, use. I, I've seen it, yeah. It, uh, it looks daft in many cases, but all that needs is some sort of toggle. All need some sort of switch. I don't think we should say, well, uh, uh, the current you know testing versions of Ubuntu Network Remix have this little oddity when they're actually working on getting drivers in there and getting the, the boot time down and all of the great network features. And we just say, oh well, we don't want Ubuntu Network Remix because of that. Just you know. But I'd, I'd rather see that be part of Moblin, so that people standardise on Moblin and work out from there. I think Moblin will be pretty good too, yeah. I'm just thinking along the lines of established current Linux distros that we can all bring up a command line on. But I know, but Ubuntu Epic Remix is completely new. It, it looks nothing like Ubuntu. I don't know, it has the Ubuntu feel to it. It's, it's got, brown. Yeah, <laughs> it's got the, the circular icons. And... Circular icons? Yeah. It feels Ubuntu-ish to me. It's brown! That's all it is, it's brown! Yeah, and I bet you, you can... You've, you've used Moblin on that little... We had a mid device, a, a demo mid device, and that looked nothing like any Linux whatsoever. That was bizarre. Yeah, but I think that's because Moblin currently, it's like LSB, it needs to go a lot further. Yeah. I think it needs to standardise on many more things to be useful. And when that's the case, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy for MSI or ASUS or Acer to customise all they want, because when so many things are standardised, they're just changing the icing on the cake. Yeah, but then you've got the problem as well. Like uh, on that mid device, if you want to tell somebody to open up the Instant Messenger, they, they could all standardise on Pigeon, but if it's called Instant Messenger on one... Distro. Standardise, then... standardise it to the point where people can't break that kind of thing. We need to say, listen, the, the menus are here. But then the menus have to be the same, and the icons should be the same. Yeah, sure, that could right. be the same. Yeah. So just use one distro, and that's it. No, I, I totally agree. The underlying things should all be the same. If they want to change the colours, if they want to add logos, if they want to add their own custom programs to do more things, like MSI Support Connect or something like that, I don't know what it is, something like that, I'm happy for them to do that, as long as the base stuff is all there. Yes. 
And that's um, almost exactly what Daz Fuller says. Uh, I think with netbooks it makes more sense to stick with a single unified system that manufacturers can modify to suit their needs, i.e. colour schemes, default apps and hardware, to, hardware support. Um, however, he says that he doesn't want to say which distro he thinks it should be for fear that supporters of rival distros might find him and hurt him in ways which he does not want to think about. Um, true, yeah, yeah. True. yeah. yeah. I, I, well, I, I can barely sleep. And, and, and that's that um, my remark. And that's a, I love a, Python, really. <laughs> and that's exactly why I don't want to give any currency to anonymous penguin who says you guys should have a video podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite happy hiding behind the microphone. Thanks, um, Julie you have B. To take your hat off. Like. <laughs> uh, Julie B says OEMs are going to want to make deals that generate money on each sale. Uh, they'll try to get a few bucks from the likes of Yahoo for adding a toolbar to Firefox or something similar. I think each OEM will have its own way. It will probably change a lot until each finds what works for them. They'll make decisions based on customer feedback, and some of which will come from those who are not familiar with Linux. Um, good points, but I'm not sure whether that's uh, in favour or against standardisation. One, one question for one of the previous comments. At what point did Linux become the competition ground for netbooks? The way I see it, if you buy a Windows laptop, they all run Windows usually home, basically home premium, but they'll run the same Vista tat. They're competing on price, features, and design for a lot of time too, how, how good things are, how quality they are. I think that it's going to be the same. It doesn't have to have a different Linux distro to be better or worse, because consumers are not in a position to be able to judge accurately that's clearly a better Linux looking at Linux Lite with this buy one. They've got no idea. All they care about is the hardware. Having watched my father buy one a few months ago, he bought a nice Samsung one. Uh, he said, you know, how many cells battery life has it got? What kind of hard drive has it got? What kind of screen resolution has it got? They're the basic things he could judge accurately by looking at a bit of paper. Uh, the, the, the distro, he's got, I have no clue. He presumably knew he could get help if he wanted to install Linux on it. I don't know. He, know, he knows he definitely can't get help. <laughs> <laughs> I've told him in the past, no. <laughs> and without further time wasting, that brings us to the end of our podcast for this week. <laughs> Oh, Mike, Mike, it's okay, it's okay. Well, it's, it just happens every single podcast. Paul never lets me do my one more thing, I know, and I, I think it's getting I a know. bit serious now. I know. Paul, Mike, you know. I, I'm, I'm just so sorry, Mike. All right, all right. So with that, my one last thing. Now, Paul, in your Discovery of the Week, you described using two exclamation marks to repeat the last command that you'd entered. I did, right. Which is great, but there's more. A single exclamation mark, followed by a series of characters, repeats the last command that started with those characters. So say, for instance, you started an SSH session ages ago. The big, long command, big, long host name, port name, stuff like that. You want to go back to it. Instead of scrolling up through your uh, bash history, just enter exclamation mark SSH, and it will run the last SSH command that you entered. Doesn't that have an element of um, Google's I'm feeling lucky? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exclamation mark RM. It's, oh my god, no! <laughs> it's also a lot of fun for trying out random commands, yeah, like nano and stuff. But, can um, you press control and R for that interactive search? You can, yeah, I search. You can, but, you know, the way I use it is just, yeah, well, yeah, I, yeah. I SSH into something no messing, a no second messing, ago, yeah. you know, and I can't be asked to scroll back, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a very good impressive work. one more thing. Yeah. Well, well done, nice, Mike. Nice yes, that's, that's good. And with that, it brings us to the real end of our podcast. Uh, I'd like to remind you, of course, about fantastic subscriptions deal for this format. It's delivered to your door 13 times a year for just 99 US dollars. Go to tinyurl.com slash podcast LXF. As a reminder, all the notes for this podcast are, of course, on the website. You can tune in two weeks' time. Two weeks' time. Fortnight. You can tune in a fortnight to uh, hear some more jokery and hopefully get the first results from Mike's uh, Throbber code for GTK3 yeah. <laughs> and Graham's Spotify client, the QG designer. <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.